Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Colin McEwen. In today's show, I join Chris Marshall, publisher of the Canadian Fly Fisher magazine, to discuss how people can make a difference. We will be fly fishing on a small stream in eastern Ontario that was once no more than a muddy and relatively lifeless waterway. Thanks to concerned citizens and a little hard work, this stream is now a vibrant fishery and ecosystem. Stay with us as we learn more about the successful work and how you too can make a difference. The new Fly Fisher is sponsored by the Atlantic Salmon Federation Bank of Montreal MasterCard, Ducks Unlimited, Canada's conservation company, Teton Fly Reels, Hodgman Outdoor Products. One of my favorite outdoor activities is to explore and fly fish on small streams and creeks. Like much of Canada and the United States, the province of Ontario is blessed with many fine waterways which possess healthy populations of trout. Like me, Chris too also has a passion for these little gardens of Eden and loves to spend a day exploring a small stream. Chris has a fair amount of small stream experience and he began the day by telling me a little bit about where to look for and expect to find trout. It's a series of riffles in shallow pools going right up to the, the canopy what, about 100 yards upstream, and there'll be fish holding the bottom end of the riffles in the tails, and particularly in places, the current is, is inclined to, to, to the right-hand bank over there, and if you see the places where there are sunken logs just sticking out into the water, mm -hmm. the current digs under those and leaves, oh, uh, uh, leaves little holes, and you get your bigger fish holding in those. You might even get a brown in there, but mainly what we'll get in here will be small brookies up to maybe eight inches if we're lucky. There's, uh, here we are, it's noon on July the 10th and there's nothing really hatching and there's no rise activity although you did say you saw a fish poke its head out just a few minutes ago but we're not casting to rising fish we're not matching the hatch we're going to be working the water and the way to do that is systematically in a pool like this you can see where the riffle begins here above that into the, we're into the tail and the water gradually deepens back into the pool we'll start at the tail and the best place to fish is just from just a few yards up here from this bank flipping it across, and we'll work our way systematically up until we catch some fish. Okay, I'll let you proceed, and obviously I mean, we're going to have to use some stealth here. We don't want to spook the fish. Lots of stealth. Yeah. And it's best to tuck right into the, as close to the bank as you can without getting in a place where you foul your back cast. And believe me, I'm going to foul my back cast. I know that. Oh, I just uh, saw a rise. Yeah, I saw yep. that one there. It's funny, when you were talking, I just saw another yep. one right over here. Okay, let's... And you can down. notice it was on the right-hand side of the current. Yeah, just on the tongue of that uh, yep. riffle. When fly fishing in small streams or creeks, you have to look for structure that will provide cover to trout. More importantly, this structure must provide access to food lanes and often deeper water in case quick escape is needed. Often a seemingly benign looking bank, rock, log, or even a shadow may actually be much deeper than they look because of the effects of hydraulics and spring runoff. The combination of cover and deep water are perfect for trout to utilize an angler should approach these spots with considerable stealth.
Hold on. Oh, pretty fish. Yeah. Magazine cover. When fly fishing on small streams, it is important to be able to vary your casting techniques to include sidearm casts, dapping, and of course roll casts. All are needed to tuck flies into tight cover or under overhanging branches. Chris, could you explain why did you bring these rocks down? Um, what, is, what is the uh, purpose of them you know, relative to this stream here? Well, oh, about 12, 13 years ago, the, this bridge wasn't here. There was another bridge lower down which was blown out in a flood. The Conservation Authority built this bridge. Uh, within a couple of years, they realized that the wire gabions, the very short wire gabions which they put in at the, uh, at the, at the at the um, uh, abutments of the bridge were being eroded by the stream in the spring runoff from behind. Mm -hmm. We brought the rocks down to extend the, re uh, the reinforcing of the bank upstream from the gabions to make sure that that erosion didn't occur behind them. At the same time, you can see we've extended them that bit further out into the stream and, and much further up. So you go way up behind us here and, and out into the current. And it narrows the current, speeds it up, keeps the bottom clean, Provides oxygenation, as you can see here, yep. and the trout habitat. And there was a rise down there just then. <laughs> Perfect. Chris, one of the things, and we've just been here collecting some of the insects, one of the things that uh, I think the viewers would really like to know about is how important it is for the stream, in order for it to be healthy, a sign of it being you know, pollution-free, having the right type of water, etc., for trout habitat and the rest of the ecosystem, is to have a good, uh, strong insect. Uh, life in, in various types of uh, insects. Mm -hmm. Could you describe a little bit about that? Yes, first of all, maybe I should say that it, we're actually in, in a riffle here. It's fast water and there are, there are stones on the bottom and, and gravel on the bottom and these are the richest parts of the stream for most invertebrates. That's where most of them live. And we've been riffling around in here and, and uh, collecting samples. And we've got a, a number of them in here and as you've noticed, it's very rich in them. There are a number of different species and lots of each. And these are indicators of a, of a healthy trout stream. In fact, some insects can only live in cool, oxygen-rich rich water. And, for instance, some of the mayfly nymphs in there, as an Isonychia bicolor, are, uh, need that cold, oxygen-rich rich water. If you're not there in, in the fast water, it's an indicator that there is perhaps something wrong with the stream. Some of them are much more sensitive even than trout. The other thing is, of course, that these provide the food for the trout. These are the bread baskets of a trout stream. And this is why you'll often find fish uh, feeding in riffles or just below them. These are prime places to, to fly fish. One of the things which helps a stream to be rich in invertebrate life is, is the pH level. The lower the pH, usually the more barren it is. This is why acid rain is bad for trout streams and for salmon rivers, because it lowers the pH, it makes them more acid, and the, 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 the more acid the stream, the less the invertebrate life can tolerate it. This stream has a very high pH, and it's a high level of, uh, of calcium, and there's a lot of limestone deposits around here, and you'll find in this stream that if you look at the rocks on the bottom, that the top side of them are calcified, that is, that they have limestone deposited on them, they're, they're rough and they're pockmarked. Mm -hmm. And if you take, well, a small one, almost that to be easier, mm -hmm. there is the bottom of the stone. Right, it's, it's all quite smooth. It's quite smooth. Turn it over. That's the top side. All the calcium and the That's limestone, right. eh? And you can scrape it right off. And it'll, wow. You can crumble it in your fingers like that. Now, if you look at that bigger one, which you just had there, yeah, right, yeah. right here, you'll see that not only does it make a limestone deposit, but it's full of little crevices and holes. Yeah. And there's, there's various kinds of moss growing on it. And you'll look even closer, and you'll see it full of oh, life. Oh, yeah, look at the insects There's, in a, here. there's oh. a little caseless caddis. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, tiny mayfly nymphs, uh, blue-winged olives, I guess, and betis. Of, we have a number in the box. We say we have the isonychia in the box. We have some uh, stenonema nymphs in the box, and also stoneflies. Stoneflies are a good big mouthful for trout, and we've got some yeah. good-sized ones in there. And we got those in just a few scrapes of the bottom, turning over just a few stones. This stream is very, very rich and capable of supporting lots of fish. I mean, the stream could only support uh, as many fish as there's food in it for. So the richer the food, the richer the invertebrate life, usually the, 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 the richer the fish life. But the key, from what I can see, Chris, uh, what's important in terms of the conservation, had it not been for the efforts of yourself and some of the other people, to change the stream and, and add features to it that would allow like this riffle here yes. uh, to, to purify itself and provide a place for invertebrates, the stream wouldn't be as healthy as it is. That's right, and you can see the healthier parts of the stream just by looking at the, the color of the bottom. As you move towards the banks where the current is slower, you'll see that there's bits of moss and fungus on, uh, on the rocks. The water's not as highly oxygenated, the current's not as fast so it can't scour them. Trout like clean gravel under their bellies. And uh, most, of the most of the invertebrates do. They like uncluttered rocks. They don't like any kind of slime or uh, sort of algae on them. They, they, li they, they like to have a certain amount, a certain amount of, of weed or moss like this. They do like crevices in the stones with a free flow of water through them, especially some kinds of caddis which spin nets and, and, and feed with this net spread out upstream and with all this uh, sort of microorganisms which come down into that net, and that's what they feed on. Uh, they couldn't do that in the middle of a lump, a lump of slimy algae. Only where you've got a fast, clean current and, and, and clear crevices with, with openings in uh, among, the, among the rocks. Of course, we didn't do it. I mean, we didn't do anything to make this stream like that, uh, to make this stream like this. This is a, a natural feature of the stream, but where it's been degraded and spread out in the current, shallowed and the, and the current slowed down it, it's like the stream's less able to make itself operate uh, operate like this you know, it turns off the engine yeah so you narrow it it turns the engine back on again and that's what we've managed to do here right by this ridge yeah and in a number of other parts of the stream so here's humans helping to repair some of the damage which, which other humans have done years ago yeah Or one which is interested in feeding. Ooh, I saw that fish. That was a bigger fish. What I'm doing is just letting a little bit more line out each time, so each swing is about a foot further downstream than the last one. Oh, I'm getting little knocks. <laughs> They're certainly not in a feeding frenzy. Oh. There's a rise. There we go. This is a trout. That looks like a pretty decent fish, Chris. No, it's not. It's not a big one. They're not big in here. Is it six inches, seven inches? Yeah. This is a little brown trout. It's a very likely hook. Twenty years ago, uh, this area here w was farmed intensively. Um, cattle were let run loose and they broke down the banks. The stream was uh, drastically widened. The flow, of course, slowed down. The water was shallow. It heated up. There was little or nothing in the way of habitat for trout. 
This was a particularly bad area here because there's a gully up there and in the spring runoff from a cornfield, uh, the, the spring runoff used to bring all kinds of silt down and gouge down and just dump it in here. And there was this long, flat silt bed which went back another 20 feet back up in towards that hillside. What we did, and this is a technique we learned from a river keeper in the UK, and this is a, a, a group of local fly fishers, what we did was take one of those techniques which involved getting logs, laying them parallel and anchoring them with stakes as if out into the current and backfilling them and then planting the edge of the backfill with, uh, with shrubs which had good strong root sections. Here we've used uh, hybris uh, cranberry. If you take a look at the bank over here, which looks almost natural, if you look very carefully, you'll see that underneath the logs which were put in 20 years ago are still there. The cranberries are grown up. They, even if the logs went to, and in some cases the logs have gone further upstream, they've gone. But the cranberries are still there, and they're, and they're holding the bank. It means, it means this, this channel has been narrowed. We've got a clear edge of the weed. There's still some silt out there, but beforehand this silt was 20 feet further back. Now it's out here. There's a good strong flow here. It's cool. The bottom's clean. And the, the weeds here make a, a good, long, clean edge with clean gravel on the bottom a good place for trout to lie, especially young fish. Uh, uh, young of the year, and uh, just after they've, uh, they've hatched for that first year, this is a perfect play, uh, habitat for a rearing area uh, for young trout. Further downstream, you'll see there are deeper pockets along the edge of the weed, uh, just out from the dogwoods, where uh, larger fish, fish can hold. And we've enhanced this somewhat, too, with rocks. You'll see places down in here where there are little piles of rocks which, you, which give bubbles and have dug a, a pocket down behind them. Great habitat, good holding water, great places to cast a dry fly to. And all the way down through this pool, which deepens down below, you'll see that there are dogwoods out over shading the water, providing cover along the edges on both banks. Twenty years ago, this was barren. There was nothing here. And so here we've got the dogwoods now protecting the, 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 very, the edges of the stream, preventing the stream from spreading out wide, keeping the flow clean and strong, providing cover. And up on the banks, we've planted cedars and pine trees, some poplars here and there to provide shade further, further up. It also provides uh, cover for uh, some mayflies after they've hatched, so they can go up into the vegetation at the sides of the, uh, the, sides of the stream shed their skins and come back as, uh, as spin spinners in the evening. It makes it a bit harder to fish, but it's a darn sight better place for trout to live, and it's a much more productive stream because of that. A healthy stream enhances the biodiversity of the ecosystem that surrounds it by providing habitat and food. One of the other benefits of, of doing work like this is that it creates habitat for other wildlife too. If you look carefully downstream, you'll see down at the bend uh, a number of birds flying above the stream. Those are cedar waxwings and they're using the trees which we planted as a place, uh, as a place to roost. They're feeding on mayflies which are hatching down there uh, on, on the corner. Really, we, I guess we should be fly fishing right now because there's a hatch going on. Uh, if it weren't for the shrubs on the sides of the tree, there'd be far fewer, uh, there'd be far fewer mayflies because be, the, before there was nothing at all for, them to, for the mayflies to rest in once they came off the water. The water quality wasn't sufficient for the, for the larva to, 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 to live successfully in the stream. And so there weren't any birds. Now, when there's a hatch on here, you'll see swallows working, skimming just above the water. You'll see kingbirds and waxwings perching in the cedars and in the uh, highbrush cranberries, which we planted on the sides of the, uh, uh, on the side, back from the sides of the stream, picking off mayflies in the air, then going back to roost in the trees. Uh, 
it's everything which benefits when people sort of uh, pull up the sleeves and get in there to make that bit of difference where humans have caused degradation. This small stream is viable proof that people can make a difference. Though it may take time, the damage wrought by man on delicate ecosystems, such as small streams, can be brought back if we are willing to put in the effort and resources to do so. For more information about resources available to you or to learn more about our series, please visit us at www.thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us here at The New Fly Fisher, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. The New Fly Fisher is sponsored by the Atlantic Salmon Federation Bank of Montreal MasterCard, Ducks Unlimited, Canada's conservation company, Teton Fly Reels,